Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today um, on a very, I wouldn't say a complex topic, but just very involved topic. There's definitely a lot, you know, um, related to the digestive system. And frankly, each digestive problem can be a topic of its own. So we're going to try to cover a broad amount of material today. And I'm going to really try to focus on some of the most important things or some of the most common things. Uh, let me start by introducing myself. I'm Dr. Sushma Hirani. Um, I did my residency and board certification in family practice in Michigan. After that, I practiced for some time in a traditional family practice office and realized there was a lot of things I couldn't treat within the boundaries of mainstream medicine. Anyway, that's when I started exploring more alternative forms, and here I am today. So my approach is that I try to combine the best of both worlds. I use traditional medicine when absolutely necessary. Um, but I prefer to use functional medicine, which is really kind of the other term that they've given it is root cause medicine, uh, which is really we're looking for the root cause, right? Really trying to understand why something is happening and address it at that very level. Okay. I've been practicing for almost 20 years now, really, really enjoy what I do. I'm medical director at Rose Wellness Center. And um, uh, let's get started here without further ado. All right, so the digestive system, what is it? Well, it's the foundation of all health. We are what we eat and absorb. The digestive system provides nutrition for every cell in our body. It plays a critical role in our immune function. In fact, it houses about 70 to 80% of our immune function. So anybody that's dealing with immune issues, whether it be autoimmune or low immune, really important to take a look at what's going on in the gut. A sick digestive system cannot do its job properly, resulting in an increase in chronic and degenerative, degenerative diseases and a steady decline of our health and well-being. Now, I just want to say also, um, you will all be getting a copy of this recording. So if, you know, if there are certain things that you want to digest through again or take a look at the slides again, all of this information um, will be available to you. Okay, and feel free to ask any questions in the chat box as we go along. I'll try to get to all the questions in the end. All right, so what is digestion? Well, it's the process by which our body breaks down food into simpler substances called nutrients. All right, the blood then carries those nutrients throughout our body for nourishment, repair, and maintenance of our cells, tissues, and organs. So very, very important process. Why do we need good digestion? Well, it really affects everything in our body. We need it for cell nourishment. We need it for healthy growth. We need it for our brain function, strong muscles and bones. And of course, we generate a lot of toxins in our body, which are all meant to be eliminated out through the digestive system as well. Now, I think if a, you know if we were to take a survey, I think most people would say that the brain is the most important organ in our body, and uh, of course, it's a. I think all organs are important, but um, of course, brain kind of beats everything because it tells the rest of the body what to do. And similarly, it really communicates with the gut and tells the gut what to do as well. It tells the gut when it needs to make digestive enzymes or how it needs to absorb its nutrients or how it needs to balance its bacteria. But guess what? The gut actually plays a very, very important role with our brain health as well. Did you know that 90% of serotonin, which is considered our happy hormone, the feel-good hormone, is made in the gut? So that's made by our gut lining and it travels up to the brain so that we feel good, right? And it helps to regulate our mood and behavior. So without the gut, the brain wouldn't be functioning very well either. Okay. So that's where it's called, you know, the gut has been many times called the second brain or they call it the gut brain connection. So a lot of what we're going to do on this talk is learn a little bit more about the functionality or the physiology of the digestive system. Some of the goals of learning this is to, one, understand that most digestive symptoms and diseases have common causes and common management strategies, okay? Um, so, so a lot of general digestive approaches can be, you know, either diagnosed or treated by understanding these common causes and treatments. 
We also want to understand how and why poor digestion can be responsible for so many other systemic effects as well, like fatigue or brain fog. It's not just limited to poor digestive. In other words, people that have poor gut function, 50% of them may not even have any digestive symptoms at all. It might just be fatigue or brain fog, for example, or depression. Okay. And then also understand that lifestyle changes are key. Uh, Hippocrates, he's considered the father of modern medicine. He once said, if you are not ready to alter your way of life, you cannot begin to heal. And that's really a, a huge part or basis or foundation of functional medicine. He also said, all disease begins in the gut. So there's four main steps in this digestive process. One, there's ingestion, where you take in the food uh, through your mouth and it travels down the esophagus or food tube into our stomach. So that's the second process is digestion, which is the mechanical and chemical breakdown of food into those smaller parts or nutrients. Number three is absorption. Now that we've broken down those foods, we need to deliver those nutrients to the rest of our body via the bloodstream. And finally, number four is elimination. There's a lot of waste that's generated throughout this process and that needs to leave the body. So let's look at the journey of food through our digestive tract. On the left side there, you see a picture um, you know, of the actual organs. And the right side there, you see a, a more kind of a cartoon, which I really liked and, and, and you know, found very interesting. So I just added it to the slide side by side, just to kind of show you here that this really is like a factory. You know, It's kind of one thing happens and which causes the next, which causes the next all the way till the end there. So let's take a look. We start again with the mouth, right? We chew our food goes down the esophagus into the stomach. In the stomach, that food is met with a lot of stomach acid. And that acid is such an important part of really breaking down and churning that food. Then all the food is dumped into the small intestine, also known as our um, sort of mixing bowl, if you will. Uh, so once it gets there, the pancreas releases certain digestive enzymes or juices. The liver and gallbladder releases bile, which helps to break up fat, and all of these things mix in the mixing bowl, further digesting those food into smaller components. Finally, that goes uh, via the small intestine, which is very rich in the, the uh, blood vessels. It gets delivered via those blood vessels to the rest of our body, and whatever wastes are generated go into the large intestine where water is absorbed back into our body, and the waste itself is eliminated through uh, the rectum and the anus. So what are some common drivers of digestive dysfunction? Stress is a very big one, and we'll talk more about that later. Unchewed food, too little stomach acid, deficiency in our pancreatic enzymes, what I call little Pac-Mans, and we'll get into all of these. Biliary stagnancy and congestion, intestinal permeability, also known as leaky gut, dysbiosis or microbial imbalance, and a sluggish or irritated colon or large intestines, okay? So these are just common things that drive many different digestive conditions. So let's start with the first. We're gonna kind of go through all these four steps. Let's start with the first one, what this is the ingestion. So many people don't think of the mouth as a digestive organ, but really it is. It's a, it's a huge part of the digestive system. And um, so I put a whole slide just dedicated to chewing here. In our modern life, we forget to just kind of sit down and chew. Do you know that we digest much better if we're sitting versus standing or walking? So you really want to kind of sit down, chew your food well, take smaller bites, chew slowly, finish swallowing your food before you take the next bite, and you know avoid drinking water while you have a mouthful of food. Okay. Um, what are some of the benefits of this? Well, one is there's less effort on the rest of your digestive system, especially if you already have a compromised digestive system, right? If you've got all this indigestion, well, let's help it along by trying to do what we can with our mouth. It also helps with better nutrient absorption and actually with healthy weight as well. All right, number two, digestion. So one of the things I really want to mention here is that our body doesn't really need to know what to do with food in its original form. So for example, it doesn't know what to do with that piece of chicken or with the orange that you ate, but it does know what to do with the amino acids that come from that chicken and with the vitamin C that comes from the orange. Those are the nutrients that actually go into our cells. Okay. So hence, again, very important to digest and break up those foods into those micronutrients. So food is pushed down into the esophagus. 
Now, our whole digestive system is constantly in this effort. It's made out of muscular tissue, and it constantly has this effort known as peristalsis, which is this movement in waves going downwards. We don't want anything coming upwards, obviously. We want everything keep going downwards, okay? So one of those areas where we promote that um, downward movement of food, an important area, is that little junction that you see in the picture between the eating tube or the esophagus and the stomach. That's known as a lower esophageal sphincter. When we eat food that opens up a little bit so food can get into the stomach and then it closes right back up. And we have various sphincters like that in, you know, throughout our digestive system. And again, that's in that effort to keep food down rather than have it go back up again. I bring this up because this is a very important um, uh, aspect of certain digestive conditions, especially reflux. And we'll come back to that topic uh, shortly. Now, once food gets into the stomach, um, like I said, it gets digested there further. The stomach is very, very rich in hydrochloric acid. This acid is so acidic that if we were to take it out of our stomach and put it somewhere on our skin, we would burn ourselves pretty badly. However, our stomach is protected by a very thick mucus layer, as you can see there, which protects the wall against the damage of the acid. So we don't all go walking around with holes in our stomach. Right. So then you ask the question, why? Why are we designed that way? Why is that stomach acid so acidic? Well, three big reasons. One, to really break down that food, especially protein. Most protein digestion occurs in the stomach. Two, to sterilize our food. Believe it or not, every time we eat, we take in bacteria, yeast, parasites, and all kinds of things. And hopefully they die in the stomach acid and don't cause any you know, further problems underneath. And three, there's, a, there's particular nutrients that we actually absorb right in the stomach itself, especially B12, iron, and calcium. So that's why, for example, you know, people that take antacids long-term, things like protonics, nexium, and those sorts of things, you know, one big uh, risk factor of those is bone loss because you know, it, it uh, uh, prevents you from absorbing calcium properly. All right. So... A lot of times when people have acid reflux, they're told that they, their stomach acid is too acidic. Believe it or not, 90% of people that have acid reflux, it's actually the opposite. They actually have low stomach acid, okay? Like I said before, that stomach acid is necessary to really break up and digest your food. Well, if you have low stomach acid, because you're not digesting that food very well, things start to push upwards, right? All this fermentation occurs, things start to push upwards. Eventually that sphincter or connection between the esophagus and stomach loosen up. And when that acid goes into your esophagus, the esophagus doesn't actually have that same thick mucosa lining. So when the stomach reaches that esophagus, you feel the burn. And the most common treatment given for acid reflux is again, antacids. So when you're taking that I just wanna point out, you're not really treating the root cause. Yes, it can be very helpful because now when that acid comes into your esophagus, it's not burning because you've just reduced its acid level. However, it's not really fixing the root cause. So once you go on antacids, you end up being on it for months, years, and some people even lifelong and eventually cause further digestive and systemic issues over time, okay? So to really treat the root cause, you wanna make sure you tighten back up that esophageal sphincter and heal up the lining of the esophageal wall. Antacids is not usually the answer. Now, in some cases, yes, it may be necessary. All right, so as I said, what happens if our stomach is not acidic enough? Well, that food sits there, stagnates, ferments, and putrefies. That fermentation process causes a lot of gases, which presents itself as excess bloating, belching, gas, symptoms of indigestion, right? And also the fermentation process generates a lot of bacteria, yeast, and you know, bad bugs, which can also accumulate in the digestive system causing further problems. So common symptoms of low stomach acid is the indigestion, feelings of fullness, with, even if you eat a little bit of food, seeing undigested food in your stools, bacterial overgrowth, and even a lot of systemic symptoms like acne, for example, very common for low stomach acid, multiple food allergies, eczema, hair loss, fatigue, osteoporosis, and multiple system systemic effects due to nutritional deficiencies like B12 and iron deficiency. 
You can see over there some of the causes of hypochlorohydria. Stress is actually a big one, and so is antacid drug use, okay, amongst other things, as you can see there. Certain nutrients like zinc and, you know, vitamin B1, thymine, are necessary to help produce our stomach acid, so those nutrients are important as well. How do we know if we have lo low stomach acid? Well, there are certain tests we can do to try to figure that out, but the most common way, really, is just by doing a trial of taking a supplement called betaine HCL. Um, and seeing how you feel, you know, if you take that and you find that, gosh, I just feel lighter. I feel like I'm digesting my food. I'm not feeling all this fullness and fermentation and indigestion. You know, you probably have low stomach acid and it's working for you. Now I do recommend doing this under medical guidance because obviously you're, you're acidifying your stomach. And for those people that truly do have too much acid, um, this can make things worse. So again, do this under medical guidance, but this can be a wonderful management tool to really help with most cases of indigestion. And I've written down some uh, some other things you can do there at the bottom of the slide as well. All right, so what are some other problems we see with stomach and esophagus besides some of the indigestion we just spoke about? Um, well, we can also see lactose intolerance, H. pylori, gastric ulcers, and more, but these are some of the most common ones. We're not going to have time to talk about all of these, but let's talk a little bit more about acid reflux. Um, so how do we get acid reflux? Well, as I mentioned before, that esophageal sphincter loosens up, you can see in the picture there, and the acid starts to come up into the esophagus, and we feel the burning and the symptoms related to that, okay? Very, very common conditions, 17 million Americans have been estimated to suffer from chronic acid reflux. So again, you want to really fix that sphincter and the esophageal lining to really try to fix this um, problem. Common symptoms include the ones I've already spoken about. And then there's common risk factors of what causes the weakening of that lower esophageal sphincter. As I've written out, I'm not going to necessarily go through you know, everything that's on here. However, um, I do also want to point out that H. pylori, which is an, a bacteria that can hang out in your stomach, can be a cause of acid reflux too. And if that's not identified and treated, you may really have a lot of trouble treating the acid reflux. Okay. And then some people actually have a structural problem, like for example, hiatal hernia, which is your stomach herniating upwards into your esophagus, into the um, you know, chest cavity. And because that's more of a structural thing, it might be hard to correct that if unless you're doing some sort of a structural treatment on it, okay, including possibly for some people surgery. So how do we treat it? Well, you know, look, try to identify what that root cause is. There are definitely certain foods which trigger acid reflux that you may want to avoid for a period of time, just until that esophageal lining heals up. These are not forever diets, but mostly for that healing to occur. Just like if we were to get a fracture, right? We want to rest that, that bone um, until it heals. And then, you know, we take the cast off and we're good to go. So same with acid reflux. You want to just avoid the things that are worsening it for a period of time, which can take two to three months. And then once that lining heals up, you're usually able to add these foods back in again. But you can absolutely use certain supplements, which are very, very helpful, healing supplements, probiotics, digestive enzymes. As you see there, I did put a question mark next to acid blockers. In some cases, very effective and necessary, but in majority of cases, that's actually not the answer. Okay. And then in very severe cases, surgery might be an option. So the birthday cake gave me terrible heartburn. Well, next time, try removing the candles before you eat it. And the reason I put this slide in here is because, again, root cause management, right? If the candles caused his heartburn, he's got to stop eating the candles. Similarly, if coffee or, you know, spicy food is causing your heartburn, you got to stop eating that for a while until things heal up, and then hopefully you're able to add it back in. All right, now that food's been digested and all that acid in the stomach, uh, like I said, it goes into the uh, small intestine, our mixing bowl. The pancreas releases digestive enzymes into that mixing bowl to digest the food further. I call these enzymes Pac-Mans. As you can see there, they're busy at work, really trying to help us uh, break up all that fat, carbohydrates, proteins, et cetera. Additionally, the bile produce, excuse me, the liver produces a substance called bile, and that bile is stored in our gallbladder. And every time we eat fat, a fatty meal, good fat, bad fat, doesn't matter. Every time we eat fat, the gallbladder releases some bile also into that mixing bowl or the small intestine to break up and digest the fat in our food as well. Okay. The bile also um, excretes toxins 
out of our body. It sends the liver, you know, filters our blood. Those toxins go into the bile, which then go into the gut and need to be eliminated out of the body. Now, when that bile thickens and hardens, gallstones can be formed. You know, there's, there's, there's certain common causes for gallstones. Diet, of course, plays a role. But one big common cause I want to point out over here is something called estrogen dominance or too much estrogen in the body, including birth control pills, which can actually thicken your bile and also cause digestive issues, including um, bile uh, gallstones. All right. So there's various different, you know, multiple different digestive enzymes. The most common ones are lipase, amylase, and protease. They break down fats into omega-3s, carbohydrates into sugars, and proteins into amino acids. So again, that's breaking your macronutrients into micronutrients, which are the usable um, nutrients for the, for the cells of our body, okay? So if these enzymes are deficient, known as pancreatic enzyme deficiency, those foods are clearly not broken down, resulting in compromised nutrition and other health issues. A lot of times people will just have kind of vague, you know, problems and, you know, fatigue, brain fog, you know, mood issues. And, you know, you may not actually have a diagnosis. You've gone to a couple doctors, oh, all your blood tests are normal, everything looks fine. Well, it might just be sluggish digestion. You're not really digesting your nutrients and that's why you're not feeling at your optimal health. Okay. Um, so very important to, to make sure you have good digestion. Additionally, obviously, if the food is sitting in there, again, it can ferment and putrefy, resulting in excessive gas, bloating, belching, abdominal pain, and all those symptoms of indigestion. Now, how do you know if your indigestive symptoms are related to low stomach acid or poor digestive enzymes? Well, it could be either one of those or it could be both. But generally speaking, if you start to get indigestion and bloating as soon as you eat, right? I've just eaten and all of a sudden your stomach bloats up and you've got this gas, et cetera, that's usually due to low stomach acid. Whereas if you're having more of these bloating and symptoms a couple of hours after you're eating, it's probably more related to digestive enzymes. Now, like I said, it could be both as well, but that's just one thing, you know, to be mindful of and observant of when you're eating to try to figure out what might be going on. So how do we treat those digestive enzymes deficiencies? There are certain foods which are just naturally rich in digestive enzymes that you can eat. A lot of times people like to supplement. Um, again, can be very, very helpful because you take those in and you find that, wow, I feel like, again, I feel lighter. I don't feel like all that food is sitting there anymore and you just feel better. And again, don't forget, chew your food, help the digestive process along. All right, now we get to number three, absorption. So now that we've digested all of those food and turned them into micronutrients magically, <laughs> not magically, you saw the amount of work that goes into it. But anyway, those nutrients now have to be absorbed. Okay. And this happens in the small intestine. So as you can see in that picture, uh, the mucosa or the lining of that small intestine contains many different folds that are covered with tiny finger-like projections called villi. And those villi in turn are covered with micro, um, further microscopic projections called microvilli. This enables us to create this vast surface area through which we can absorb all these nutrients. Okay, so very, very important for us to absorb these nutrients. Now, each of those microvilli are very rich in capillaries and blood vessels, as you can see here as well. That's where those micronutrients like the vitamin C or the omega-3 or whatever it might be, you know, gets into the bloodstream and travels across that bloodstream to the rest of our body cells and tissues to do what it needs to do. It's end action on that particular organ, okay? And you can see an example that, of that over here. Those digested nutrients cross through that uh, intestinal lining into the bloodstream going to the rest of the body. What are some functional disruptions that occur in the small intestine? Uh, one big one or common one is intestinal permeability or leaky gut syndrome, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, another big one is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth known as SIBO. I find that people are not as familiar with this one, interestingly, even though it's, it's very, very common, especially if you have hypothyroidism. I would say about 60% of people that have hypothyroidism tend to have SIBO. SIBO is a whole different topic on its own. It's so involved. There's just so much to go over it. So even though it's very common, I'm not going to talk a lot about it or at all really about it today, except for whatever's on this slide. Um, but I will be doing another talk on SIBO alone. But just I wanted to bring out that awareness. Other disruptions in the small intestine, food allergies, intolerances, and just general symptoms of toxicity and nutrient deficiencies. So what is leaky gut syndrome? So normally our small intestine acts like a selective sieve. 
It only allows small nutrients like those well-digested foods into the bloodstream, right? Like a gatekeeper, if you will. In leaky gut syndrome, there's an increased permeability of that wall where large spaces develop between the cells. And now it loses that selectivity and these large toxins like bacteria, uh, other toxins, und undigested food leak into the bloodstream instead, leading to a whole host of symptoms, diseases, and conditions. Here's another slide depicting the same thing. You can see on the left side, we've got a healthy lining or mucosa, only allowing the nutrients to pass through and blocking everything else. On the right side, in a leaky gut or unhealthy mucosa, the reverse happens, right? All those larger toxins go into the bloodstream instead, um, contributing to increased toxic buildup, inflammation, allergies, and autoimmune conditions. So remember what I said before, 70% of our immune system lies in the gut. So when all these other things are getting in there, the immune system is saying, hey, what is all of this stuff? It doesn't belong. I only recognize vitamin C and vitamin D and you know omega-3. I don't recognize all these bacteria and these undigested food. What the heck are these things? So because of our normal protective mechanism, our gut launches this, our immune system launches this attack to try to you know, attack all of this. And that process is what generates inflammation, allergies, and even further damage to that intestinal lining, kind of causing this vicious cycle. What are some of the symptoms of leaky gut? Again, I'm not gonna read through all of these, but the most important thing I wanna point out over here is that up to 50% of people with leaky gut have no digestive symptoms, okay? They may just have several vague, you know, dig um, systemic symptoms as seen on the slide over here. So um, again, you know, it might be helpful to do a stool test to really identify what's happening in your gut if you have a lot of these other uh, conditions. Causes of leaky gut, again, you can see a lot of uh, just similarities there in the causes, you know, low stomach acid, low digestive enzymes, poor diet, et cetera. But a big thing I wanna point out over here is gut infections, like again, SIBO, candida overgrowth parasites can play a very big role with leaky gut and also certain medications. Again, those chronic um, antacids, acid blockers, okay? Uh, Protonix, Nexium, Prilosec, et cetera, if you use them chronically, can certainly cause damage to the gut lining. Stress can cause damage to the gut lining. Antibiotics, and even NSAIDs, which are your you know, Motrins and Advils and uh, similar medications. Another little cartoon there, my leaky gut. So no, we don't actually leak things <laughs> out of the body, but we do leak things out of the intestine into the bloodstream. Okay. All right, and then our fourth step over here, elimination, going down that factory. So elimination occurs, you know, um, in the large intestine. The large intestine, really all those waste products that are generated from this whole process of digestion, uh, all those waste products get into the large intestine. And a lot of those waste products consist of the undigested part of the food known as fiber, okay? Fiber is actually not absorbed into our body. Fiber is more kind of what I call a sweeping agent. It just sweeps, you know, um, the walls of that large intestine to try to get junk and toxins and everything out of there. And also a lot of the older cells that shed from this mucosa lining, those were also released. All of these materials are pushed into the colon or large intestine where they remain until you're ready to have a bowel movement and get rid of it out of your body. And keep in mind, a lot of the foods that we eat um, are not always 100% food, right? They come with, unfortunately, a lot of other things in it, additives, preservatives, colors, high fructose corn syrup, and all this other junk that our digestive system doesn't quite know what to make of, right? It looks at all of this and goes, hey, you're not food. I don't, I don't really know what to do with you. So all of that needs to be filtered through the liver, um, pushed into the colon and out of the body because it's not supposed to absorb and nourish any of our cells. And if it does, get to our cells through leaky gut, you can see we're weakening those tissues causing, you know, damage. Okay. So toxins definitely can uh, go into those cells tissues and cause functional um, imbalances. What are some common problems we see the, with the large intestines? Dysbiosis, which is a bacterial imbalance, candida overgrowth, irritable bowel syndrome, constipation, diarrhea, diverticular disease, and inflammatory disease. Again, a lot of these can be a topic of their own. We will talk a little bit today about the two top com most common ones, which is the dysbiosis and irritable bowel syndrome. So what is our microbiome? So there's trillions of bacteria, fungi, and all kinds of other microbes that live in us or on us. 
In fact, within our own bodies, they outnumber our cells by 10 to one. So for every one human cell we have, we actually have 10 bacterial or microbial cells. This has been known for decades, for a long time, but you know they didn't really know what to do of it or make of it. They just thought, okay, we've got all this bunch of stuff in our body. Mostly it's a nuisance, maybe a source of infection. And it was kind of largely ignored for many, many years. In the last 10 years or so, however, there's been a lot more research on our microbiome. And scientists have discovered that, wow, this is actually very invaluable to human life. In fact, many scientists call our microbiome an organ of its own because it's doing so much. Okay, all of these microbes work together as one self-organizing, self-directing organism, kind of like a supercomputer with untold intelligence and insight into storing health. All right, through all these microbes, information is extracted from food, the immune system is regulated, inflammation is dealt with, communication pathways are restored, and our natural defenses are repaired. So very important that our microbiome is in a good balance. About 80% of our microbiome should consist of good bacteria, also known as probiotics. The other 20% consists of just other bacteria, yeast, parasites, and all kinds of things. Um, you know, and as long as they stay at that 20%, they usually live in there peacefully, do no harm. All right. You can see all the important functions of probiotics over here um, play a role in not only a lot many processes of our digestive system, but even beyond. OK, they actually help to manufacture a lot of our nutrients. OK, and um, um, help to create the fuel to keep a healthy digestional tract. Also think of probiotics kind of like our army. Remember, our body's always trying to protect us, right? So our probiotics are army. All the bad guys, the parasites, eat bacteria, those are kind of like, well, invaders. So whoever is stronger wins. If we have more of the army in there, we're going to keep the bad guys away. But obviously, if we don't have a good army, those bad guys are going to enter and take over. So on this slide over here, you can just kind of picturally, you know, visually see the difference. Look at all those friendly, beneficial probiotics doing their job. They're just working so hard, keeping everything clean, healthy, nice and smooth. And then you've got those bad bacteria, right, doing the opposite. So the more of the good bacteria you have, the more you keep away the bad bacteria. Now, if the bad bacteria overgrow beyond that 20% threshold, they do become bad. Um, in other words, they really kind of create a lot of damage to that intestinal lining, generate a lot of inflammation, and they actually release a lot of their toxins into the gut, the bloodstream, and the body. Those toxins are known as LPS, lipopolysaccharides, all right? And again, if you have a leaky gut, then those toxins leak through that gut lining into the bloodstream to the rest of our body, and you can see how that can cause you know, a whole host of issues, including autoimmune diseases. There have been at least 40 different conditions which have been linked to dysbiosis or this microbial imbalance. You know, so sometimes somebody will come into me with, you know, a heart condition, for example, high blood pressure or diabetes or something like that. And I say, all right, well, let's look at your gut. And they look at me like I've, you know, grown horns on my head. They're like, weren't you listening to me, doctor? I came in for a heart problem. <laughs> so um, anyway, that's when I really get into the education. So there are certain bad bacteria that if they overgrow, those lipopolysaccharides, if they overgrow in the gut, guess what? They co and they cause damage to our heart and blood vessels. So if we can identify those and get rid of it, guess what? We've just prevented or reduced our risk of heart disease and various heart ailments. Isn't that pretty cool, right? So same thing with metabolism. There's actually a whole part of our digestive system known as the metabolome through which we metabolize foods, actually extract energy out of it, okay, um, to help uh, to maintain a healthy weight. And there have been, I don't know, hundreds of studies now proving that the right type of bacterial balance in the body can help with good weight loss and, uh, you know, me me um, metabolism balance. All right. And you can see on the slide, autoimmune, cancer, liver disease, a whole host of things that can be, can be related to dysbiosis or imbalance in our gut bacteria. And how do we know if we have these things, by the way, um, whether it be microbial imbalance or whether it be lack of digestive enzymes, low stomach acid, or any of these things, leaky gut, we can actually test for all of these. And I'll get into testing in, in detail a little bit later. Can we impact or alter our microbiome? Absolutely, we can. Again, there's different resources that, that do show this. This one is from Science Direct. But basically, you know, if you're going to choose to eat more fiber, um, reduce your stress, 
and eat more probiotic and prebiotic rich foods, you're going to definitely get more probiotics in there, good bacteria. If you're going to choose to eat more sugar, alcohol, you know, live a high stress life and, um, you know, take a lot of antibiotics and a lot of these medications, which can lead to dysbiosis, then you'll go the opposite direction, right? So you can actually impact this. It's not always easy, of course, to do all of these things, but just know that it is definitely doable. It's not like we're stuck with one or the other. All right, irritable bowel syndrome or IBS. Uh, about one in five Americans have IBS, making it one of the most common disorders diagnosed by doctors in the United States. This is very, very common and unfortunately a very you know, debilitating condition. It's not dangerous, it's not life-threatening, but very debilitating. And people that suffer from irritable bowel syndrome, you know, they really suffer significantly, not only just from the, you know, the digestive and physical symptoms of this, but from an emotional perspective as well. You know, if you're dealing with diarrhea, constipation, you know, it's, it's embarrassing sometimes in social situations, always making sure there's a bathroom with you. How do I travel without being scared of, you know, um, some sort of an accident happening? So it's very traumatic, especially for those people that have moderate to severe IBS. Okay. Um, so what is this? Well, it's a functional disorder of the large intestine. And like its name implies, it's basically your bowels are irritated by something. All right. Whether it be a food intolerance, whether it be a, um, you know, a, a bacteria, a parasite, uh, you know, it's some or toxin, something that's irritating your bowel and your bowel either reacts by hyperreacting, causing diarrhea, or by actually getting shocked by this stuff and underreacting, causing constipation. So those are some of the hallmark symptoms of IBS. You'll either have constipation, diarrhea, or both. Some people will cycle between the two of those. Other common symptoms including abdo include abdominal pain, cramping, bloating, urgency, et cetera. Most people that have IBS usually have a colon that's particularly sensitive and may respond strongly to you know, stimuli like stress, foods, et cetera. I'm afraid that your irritable bowel syndrome has progressed. You know how furious and vindictive bowel syndrome. So again, it's irritated. Let's find what the source of irritation is and see if we can't get rid of it. What are some causes of IBS? Again, similar things, right? But common food causes, by the way, are gluten, dairy, and sugar. These are, you know, so if you're if you're dealing with IBS that's related to food intolerances, those by far are going to be the most common foods that can trigger the irritation, all right? Um, pancreatic enzyme deficiencies, intestinal permeability, dysbiosis again, you know, other gut infections. So if you've got candida or parasite that's triggering your irritation, let's get rid of it because that might help. Intestinal inflammation due to other causes and stress. Stress is a big one here. So again, how do we know? Well, let's test. We don't always have to guess. Now, it's important to kind of understand the picture of symptoms you have because you kind of already have an understanding of what might be going on, but then we can test to have a you know a clearer understanding so that we can treat accordingly. So the functional stool test, this is something, you know, in the toolbox of really every functional medicine practitioner, including myself, most of my patients are going to get a functional stool analysis, looking at that microbiome and seeing everything else that's going on in there, whether you have digestive symptoms or not. Because like I said, you know, if you're coming in with general chronic fatigue syndrome or autoimmune diseases, we may need to do a functional stool analysis as well. We may do food allergy or intolerance testing. You can do something called organic test, acid testing, looking for cellular function and toxins in the body. To diagnose SIBO, you got to do a breath test. You can test for H. pylori, and then, of course, a bunch of traditional tests, um, looking with the camera in there to see what's going on as well. Here's a sample of some functional stool analysis testing. There's, there's all, you know, many different companies out there that do this, very good ones. I've just put an example of Genova Diagnostics on here as one of the companies. You can see on the left side over here, um, you know, it, it actually breaks up into categories, what might be happening with you. So in this sample patient, you know, it, the first uh, first section there is looking at digestion. Do they have adequate enzymes and stomach acid and breaking up fat properly? If not, well, let's, let's do something about that. Second category is looking at inflammation, right? Do you have gut inflammation? If not, where is it coming? I mean, if you do, where is it coming from? And again, what can we do about it? 
Third category is actually measuring your good, bad bacteria. On the right side there, you kind of see a sample of what it looks like to measure a lot of the good bacteria. Now we have trillions, of course, of bacteria, and this is nowhere near a completely accurate representation, but it can still give us a good idea of what's going on. Do you have a good balance, that 80-20 balance, or not? Do you have too much bad? Do you have too little good? Or do you have both? Um, we can measure if you have damage to that gut lining or leaky gut. We can measure if you're getting rid of toxins properly or if you're holding on to those wastes. And finally, we can also measure infections like parasites or other bacteria. Here's a sample of a food intolerance testing. Again, many different companies out there. I've used just one specific example here, um, but most of those companies will rate these as you know high, moderate, low to give you an understanding of which foods are, are really a big problem. So you can kind of determine, all right, you know, um, do I want to keep these foods away for a period of time until things heal back up? And then hopefully be able to add them back in again once you do correct all those root causes. So how do we fix a lot of these different things we've talked about today from IBS to leaky gut, you know, to all these different things. There's kind of a protocol that's used by most functional medicine doctors, including myself, known as the 5R program for gut health. Okay, so the first R stands for remove offending substances. Let's remove those allergens if we know you have them. Let's remove the processed foods, right? So all those things that the digestive system doesn't know how to digest, like additives, preservatives, colors. Let's try to keep those to a minimum. You know, if we've identified gut infections like SIBO or parasites or candida, let's remove those. Let's kill them. Um, and of course, environmental pollutants. Second R stands for re-inoculate. So if you've got too little of the good bacteria, those beneficial probiotics, well, let's repopulate the gut with those, either through foods or supplements. The third R stands for replace. Again, if we've identified that you have too little stomach acid, digestive enzymes, or the bile salts to break up your fats, let's replace through foods, again, or through supplements. Okay, there's supplements for all of these, which are pretty healthy, uh, excuse me, pretty benign uh, for the most part. The only one, like I said, just be careful of is the hydrochloric, uh, the betaine hydrochloride. But most of the rest of these are really pretty well tolerated by most people. Fourth R stands for repair. Let's heal up that gut mucosal lining with gut healing foods. And again, um, the healing supplements like glutamine. And finally, the fifth R stands for rebalance. Do we do need to address nutrition, hormones, sleep, lifestyle, and stress? Okay. Now, these five R's don't all need to be done, you know, in a particular order. Um, they could either be done one or two at a time, or they can all be done simultaneously. It really just depends what's going on and what you and your doctor have decided together. You know, some people like to kind of break things up and say, all right, let's work on this category and then let's work on this. And I, I, I like going that way. Um, other people say, let's, let's just get it all at once. So there's no right or wrong. Again, it really depends on what you see, what's going on and what your approach style is like, right? In, in partnership with your doctor. But important to know what's going on, get those answers, and get at that root cause. So um, some of these conditions would ha will have like specific food plans, you know, that you may need to follow that might be helpful. But in general, some general dietary approaches to treatment include increasing dietary fiber. Very, very important to get the right kind of dietary fiber, which can help with the majority of digestive health issues. Now, caution in those people that have SIBO. In SIBO, you actually may need to follow a low fiber diet called a low FODMAP diet, because in that case, what happens is all that fiber ferments, causing more bacteria to overgrow. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, increase fiber for general um, digestive issues, eliminate processed foods, eat real food, eat foods that are rich in probiotics, prebiotics, and polyphenols. Poly polyphenols are basically high fiber foods that are also very rich in antioxidants. And those antioxidants do a fantastic job of really healing a lot of our digestive organs amongst other things. You wanna make sure you're eating foods that heal back up a lot of that gut lining, right? So you're not leaking through, um, leaking the bad stuff through there. Bone broth, omega-3 foods, collagen peptides, et cetera. And then a very important part of this, if you suspect that you have food allergies or intolerances, you want to try to eliminate those. Again, that's the healing, like the fracture. Studies do show that about two-thirds of people with IBS have at least one food intolerance, and some of them have multiple. In fact, many of them have multiple, the most common being dairy and gluten, okay? 
allergy testing, you can do all of this either by doing an allergy test or even just through an elimination diet, where basically you can just eliminate one or more of those food groups and see how you feel and do. And if you find, you know, you've done it for a week or two and you go, gosh, I feel so much better. And then you add the dairy back in. And of course, all your symptoms come back. Well, you know, dairy is the problem, for example. Okay. Avoid diets that are rich in refined foods and refined sugars, excuse me. Um, sugar does tend to slow down that intestinal movement or peristalsis right, and lead to constipation. So we couldn't find a raw, vegan, gluten-free, sugar-free, non-GMO cake for your birthday. So we got you nothing. So sometimes, you know, when people are, are kind of looking through this or even listening to me talk today, you feel like, well, then what can I eat? You've just told me not to eat all these things. There actually is a lot that you can eat. You just want to pick your foods appropriately. Again, you want to eat a lot of the fibers through fruit and vegetable fibers through, you know, whole certain types of whole grains through, um, you know, legumes, lentils, um, omega-3s. So there's a lot you can eat, you know, working with a functional medicine doctor or a health coach or a nutritionist will really open your eyes to a lot of what that what's out there that you may not have even really realized or known. Okay. So I tell people to focus on the foods you can eat rather than focusing on the ones you cannot eat. I've just given you some slides over here of prebiotic rich foods. What are prebiotics? Those are the foods which help which is the food for the probiotic. Okay, so probiotics feed on prebiotics so they can grow better. So these are prebiotic rich foods. We've got probiotic rich foods or which are usually fermented foods, polyphenol rich foods. All right, and, and, um, and you know, again, general dietary things that we can do to help out there as we discussed already. Now, stress of course is a big one. In fact, some people may not have any functional digestive disturbance or having all these digestive symptoms. They come into me, and, you know, we, we look into all this and there's really nothing going on in their gut and all their symptoms are because of stress. So in that case, very important to identify that and treat the stress. Now, when we are chronically stressed or high stressed, we produce certain stress hormones like cortisol, for example. And those stress hormones can go and actually shut down a lot of digestive processes. Okay. So for example, it can reduce production of stomach acid and digestive enzymes. It can actually make that gut lining more permeable, leading to leaky gut. The stress hormones can cause inflammation in the body. They can alter the peristaltic movement of that intestinal wall, and they can actually directly reduce those beneficial gut probiotics, right? So people go, oh, I'm eating all these probiotics. Why are my probiotics so low? Well, the cortisol or stress hormone could be doing that as well. So very important, you know, to manage stress, not only from a lifestyle perspective, but from a biochemical perspective and see what's going on with those stress hormones and how those can be managed as well. Again, this is another topic <laughs> for another day. All right, what are some general supplemental approach to treatment? Now, really on the slide, I've just kind of thrown in, you know, a bunch of common supplements that are used for gut health. Um, my intention is not for you to go out and get everything on the slide, okay? Really, this has got to be done in a little bit more of a systematic way. You want to, again, understand what might be the root cause of your particular digestive issue and then use these supplements accordingly. All right. So for example, you know, the digestive enzymes or the betaine or, you know, probiotics, or, you know, again, looking at that root cause, see what's going on. If you've got gut infections, use these anti you know, these antibacterial herbs or healing herbs to heal up um, gut lining. So you want to use these supplements in a very focused and targeted way. And of course, treat by prevention. Right. So some of you may be on here today, maybe for other family members or friends and you're feeling OK, but, you know, hopefully you've learned a lot through this. And then, of course, most people will end up having some digestive problems in their life or the other. So you really, really want to treat by prevention as well, starting with number one, chew your food thoroughly. <laughs> OK, so, again, I'm not going to go everything on this slide because we've kind of gone through it, you know, throughout the visit. But um, remember, prevention is the best medicine. So again, remember, we are what we eat and absorb. So some people, you know, come into me and say, gosh, I'm eating really well. I just don't understand why I've got, you know, anemia and all these, you know, nutritional disturbances. Well, again, there might be a functional disturbance in your gut that we need to identify and correct that. Okay. And also remember, the harder your body has to work on digestion, the less energy it has to work on other functions. So definitely take care of yourself by figuring out that root cause and eating well. You definitely deserve it, right? The more, op the more you optimize your digestion, the more you optimize the rest of your health. 
So thank you very much, um, audience. You, you've been wonderful. I know some of you have written some questions. I'll get to those questions in just a moment. A couple of things. One is, um, again, you will get a recording of this presentation. So I realize I've gone a little bit faster than I would like to, uh, but that's just because of the sheer content that we had to cover here. And some of these things, so if you, spe if you specifically have one of these conditions and you want to really get into that into detail, there will definitely be more topics coming up about those as well. Um, so, you know, feel free to, again, digest through this information at your own uh, time and leisure when you get the uh, presentation. And of course, please feel free to call our office at any time if you have any questions or would like further support with some of your digestive concerns. Now, I am personally not taking new patients at this time. However, we have other wonderful practitioners in our office. And really, again, um, digestive medicine is one of the foundations of functional health. So really that is something that all functional medicine doctors really know how to treat very well. But I really wanted to get this information across because there's some things you may already find that you can do on your own to help yourselves and whatever is more challenging or you can't you know, figure out, please go ahead and, and get some help through a health coach or a nutritionist or functional medicine doctor to really kind of understand. Again, thank you so much. Um, and let's get to some of these questions. Give me a moment here. <clears throat> 